That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Master Gardener, the 22nd film directed by Paul Schrader, which premiered out of competition at the 2022 Venice Film Festival because Mr. Schrader received the Golden Line for Career Achievement. Uh, and it is premiering in the U.S., courtesy of Magnolia Pictures, on May 19th, 2023. I know Paul Schrader is an accomplished filmmaker, and I know I've seen at least one Paul Schrader film. Oh, you've seen several many. I mean, of course, he was Scorsese's uh, favorite screenwriter of the 70s and 80s for Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, but we did a uh, podcast for Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. You've seen... Oh, that's Paul Schrader? Mm -hmm. oh. You've seen a... The Ethan Hawke movie. First Reformed, which is the first part of the Man in a Room trilogy, which Master Gardener is... Um, completing that cycle you've seen his remake of cat people which i quite oh. like which this is his also with master gardener he's also returning to new orleans to film where that was shot you've seen american gigolo oh. um i know you've seen dog eat dog with uh willem dafoe and nicholas cage um very uh, accomplished very interesting very provocative very smart uh filmmaker even when not everything maybe hits the mark the plot of this movie a meticulous horticulturalist who is devoted to tending the grounds of a beautiful estate and pandering to his employer, the wealthy dowager. That's, okay, so the meticulous horticulturalist is played by Joel Edgerton. And you know what I was reading? The title, Master Gardener, is a reference to an amateur uh, version of a horticulturalist. Oh. Which is kind of a hint to, I think, what's going on with this character as well. So... Joel Edgerton's the horticulturalist. The wealthy dowager is Sigourney Weaver. Oh, yes. Norma Haverhill. The, the plot's pretty simple. Sigourney Weaver owns this beautiful uh, like estate and garden called Gracetown. Gracewood Garden. Gracewood. And Joel Edgerton runs the garden. And one day Sigourney tells Joel, Hey, I have a grand niece who... I need to take care of. She's my sister's granddaughter. And my sister and my granddaughter and my niece are dead. So now she's alone and she's in a little bit of trouble with the law. I think she has a drug problem and she's of mixed blood. When she says mixed blood, I'm like, uh, okay. which for that character, uh, I guess means that she's biracial and black. So, the young girl shows up, Maya, played by... Quintessa Swindell, who we recently saw in Black Adam. And Sigourney wants Joel to basically make her his apprentice. And he does, and she seems to love it, and she takes to it like a fish to water. But a couple of things happen. Joel is having an affair with Sigourney, or she's using him, like, for sex, basically. Yeah, she he's basically her indentured sex servant. Yes. Mm -hmm. But... Joel also becomes romantic, kind of, with Maya, the grandniece. And that is sort of problematic just in general, but even more so because Maya's black. And we find out that Joel Edgerton's character is a white supremacist. Like, on a level that... Was. Well... Mm -hmm. Yep, no, no, that's... He is covered in tattoos... He has white power tattooed and big bold letters on his back, swastikas everywhere. And if the tattoos aren't enough, we get flashbacks to a previous life of his where we see him killing a black man in front of his family. He like surrounds himself with other white supremacists and they're violent. But Joel Edgerton's character is placed in protective uh, custody like a... Uh, like witness protection. witness protection because he agreed to testify against his compadres to get them all prison time. So now he's free, but in witness protection. So that's why he works for Sigourney Weaver. But everything culminates with Sigourney getting mad when she finds out that he may be having sex with her grandniece. So she kicks them out. And then they go on like a two day road trip that only extends to like 90 minutes away, I guess that part's confusing to me. Uh, but they fall in love, which you have some good points about, and Joel tells Sigourney, like, we're in love, we're going to get married, and we're going to live on the property. The end. I think this movie is provocative. Yeah. Uh, I didn't care for it, but I think it's a great watch. 
Like I would recommend it if you're interested in talking about issues pertaining to this and want to have an adult conversation. It just didn't work for me and we can talk about why. Sure. And I think it's supposed to leave you, it's, Schrader never leaves anything, uh, it's never easy. Uh, and if you're left feeling uncomfortable, I, I believe that it, that is on purpose. Of course, I have a fondness for Sigourney Weaver. Oh, so, same, yes. You know, but I'm going to be honest about how I feel about the movie. Uh, so starting with her character. Norma. She looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My biggest issue with her character, well, there are two things. I don't know that we needed her character. I understand her function and it makes sense. But I think because I feel like other things needed to be better developed, she could have been eliminated. But she's also a little campy. The movie's not funny. Like, it's a serious movie. But all of the comedic dialogue mildly comedic dialogue comes from her well yeah it's it's over the top and i know that she read she approached it as kind of like tennessee williams territory and she kind of strays away from playing characters like that because i think of that uh, interpretation often of it but she, i don't know wealthy rich people that are in a bubble you know tend to feel like they can it's not it's not ludicrous but it was kind of like oh this once we understand what's going on, which is pretty early on in the film, that Joel Edgerton's character is a white supremacist, we don't fully understand that he's a witness protection program until a little later, but it, it was interesting. I mean, she... But but, but she is fun. She's fun. I, but there, there's also weird complexities and hierarchies, obviously, going on there. But she... The, the sex scene that the hint of a sex scene that we see with them is uh, her making him take his shirt off, which he ca kind of wears like a second skin. It's almost a protective layering because he's trying to distance himself. He, uh, and he's almost like monk like. He's very ascetic in his behavior and everything. Um, and she likes that. She likes that about him. And her, paired with her uh, comment about mixed blood. mixed blood and kind of her, uh, Ma, how she felt about Maya's father, there are very sinister things going on that make me feel for more than one reason that Maya's maybe not really in a good place no. by the end of the film. Um, she does have a line where she says money is the best manure. Mm -hmm. I thought that was funny. Of course, the film is a, a grand metaphor for, the, as the title says, gardening. And the tagline is the seeds of love grow the same as the seeds of hate or something like that. And, it, and, and we're hearing Joel Edgerton read aloud in his diary that he keeps that's kind of part of his personal therapy and that's all very ripe with uh, subtext about what's going on with the character that's my next note because i think the, the so the narration provided by joel edgerton as he writes in his diary the actual words some of them were actually quite profound i wrote down that gar gardening is the most accessible of the arts it's already there mm -hmm. and that segment i thought made a lot of sense to me I didn't care for Joel Edgerton's approach to the manner of speech of his character. I felt like it felt kind of s stiff and sing-songy, like he was practicing a very specific I, style. Because I think he's faking it. I think he he's tried to distance... I get that, and it's kind of... There's a lot of this film that feels uncomfortable in ways that, like, is that on purpose? Um, but I think he, he's trying to be something else he believes he is but he hasn't really atoned and i think that his relationship that develops with maya i i read that as him feeling this is his because he puts his he puts his ass on the line really to help her with her little drug addict boyfriend and i, I think it's because he feels guilt that he's never had to deal with he's been in a safe place right working for sigourney but also as her her sex lay but he's never really had to account for the life he used to lead. I think the diet... So when we finished the film, I, I said that I felt like the person who created the film maybe is a little out of touch. I, I see the intention. You explained that it's part of a trilogy about uh, redemp like these singular characters and redemption, and that makes sense. It is provocative or thought-provoking. So it works on that level. I just felt like the way the characters are interacting, like... I mean, Joel, his character tells Maya something like they're, they're concerned about when, you know, their employees get drunk or post a sexist meme like that bothers us. It just felt very like, oh, maybe like an older man thought sure. like this is th like these are things that young people do. It 
Sure, that, I'm not. I, of course, Schrader is of a certain age and, my, and might be a little out of touch. But the theme that's run throughout all of his films really is repression and, and repressed emotions and people running from themselves. Even outside of this trilogy that includes First Reform and The Card Counter, um, and I think that uh, what well, we we had a lengthy discussion after watching it, and it's the second time I've seen it last night. And I think what is also troubling is it's not he's not exploiting this kind of these racist subtext but it's not really the focus like it's just a detail about this character that seems almost like you know we just pasted that in there and it's a little bit topical because we're talking about the proud boys etc et uh and i think that also adds to this level of well we're not really not delving into it but and because of that we don't really get quintessa swindell's character she does have a moment and she does have thoughts about the discomfort about Edgerton's history, but we don't, we're denied a catharsis of her really getting to grapple with it and saying she's okay. So Maya, I think understanding her character the best we can is important because it seems like maybe she grew up not having a lot of resources. It's clear that she has drug addiction issues. She goes to an NA meeting and says she's a drug addict. Uh, she has an abusive boyfriend and at a point she comes to work one day and her boyfriend has whooped her ass. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a catalyst for, and it is because after, after Sigourney find is mad at Joel, she says like, both of y'all need to leave my house tonight. So they leave. And Maya's like, well, I need to stop by my apartment to pick up a few things. And prior to that, she had already, expo she, Joel knew that she had been beaten up by her boyfriend, so he had his, it's not a parole officer, but the, the law enforcement agent involved in his witness protection played by... Uh, Isai Morales, uh, out of the Marshal Service. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. okay, so he's a U.S. Marshal. So he, Joel asks for a favor, like, can you go and, like, basically, like, scare this guy because he beat up his girlfriend, who's one of my employees, and he does. So... Joel goes to take Maya to get some of her belongings. And while she's in her apartment, he, she points her boyfriend out. So Joel goes to him to maybe threaten him again. And this scene really threw me off for a lot of reasons. Sure. First of all, I know that this movie is classified as a thriller. There's nothing thrilling about it. There's nothing suspenseful about it. And then when they go to the apartment and Joel's driving to confront the boyfriend, the score is making us think that there's going to be a big confrontation. Child, when we see that boyfriend, because I assumed he was going to be a big, tough guy. How would you describe that boyfriend? He was, he looked like he played video games and smoked a lot of weed. He looked he, like he, he spends was... all day playing Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. and smoking out of a bong. Mm -hmm. And he probably lives somewhere in like a suburb of Portland. I, it just felt so off. Didn't get all his vitamins, maybe. And then here's where Joel's character. So Joel never says, and we'll talk about how he... He never really says he's not racist anymore, that he's not a white supremacist. He says All, he was an ex-supremacist, I think. He but, says that was my, previ like, my I'm previous a, life. That was my previous life. I'm a gardener now. That was back then. He never... And then when he approaches the ex-boyfriend, who's this white guy, he's with a Latino guy. And immediately Joel's like... He calls him a derogatory term. He calls him a beaner. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, so I see these racist tendencies pop up real quick. And then Joel threatens both of them with some pruning shears, which was laughable. Then when he goes back to pick up Maya, because... And they realize what he is, though. They call him a proud boy. And then when they later vandalized his home on Gracewood Estates, they put swastikas out. That's over. right. They'd know what he is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I would also assume that based on his appearance, the fact that he called me a beaner, and he's driving this big-ass pickup truck. Mm -hmm. But when he goes to pick up Maya... Because Joel's character is also a drug addict, he recognizes like, oh, you took so damn long because you were in there getting high. So he confronts her, makes her throw the drugs away. And then we get a montage, like a five minute montage sure. where they are like she's detoxing, which amounts to her vomiting for a second. And then they immediately go to an N.A. meeting and then magically she's cured like she's not a drug addict anymore. I thought that was handled very strangely. Sure. But we need to talk about how Maya... Because I want to know what people think about this. So Maya is... It's clear she's biracial, like black and white. 
And the way we meet her, she's wearing a shirt, like a tie-dye shirt that says... Um, no bad vibes. No bad vibes. And she seems like the kind of young lady who is, has an awareness of things and, and, and opinions. But she's also a woman in trouble. That's true, too. This is why it's provocative. Mm -hmm. But, and of course, like you mentioned, Joel's character keeps his shirt on because he doesn't want his tattoos exposed. But now that he and Maya have kind of connected and they're staying in the same hotel room, this one night he takes off his shirt while he's sitting at the desk writing and she's in bed. And we see her, like, it's it, it's unclear she saw him because she's asleep in bed. But the next day, she confronts him while they're having, like, lunch at a museum or a garden. And her reaction is like, I saw those tattoos. What is that about? Why didn't you remove them? And he's like, well, I thought about it, but I didn't. And then she gets mad and gets up and walks away. And that's the only reaction we get from her. Like, literally, it's like... 50 words <laughs> and then well she says could you understand how uncomfortable that would make me right very obvious short conversation then we cut to the most awkward sex scene i have ever seen in a film it is really awkward because uh, because yep. joel says like in his as he's narrating his diary that he got this night after the confrontation like she's upset they got two separate hotel rooms and she didn't say anything. And she didn't say anything, anything to him all day. And then all of a sudden, she's knocking on their connecting door. And she walks in like a sex doll robot and basically says, I want you. I want to get naked. I want to get naked. And he's equally robotic. And she does. And then she tells him to. And he tries to keep his shirt on. And then she makes him take off his shirt. And she goes... You're going to have to get those tattoos removed. And he acknowledges, okay. And then he sort of kisses her navel, and then that's it. And then there's kind of this fantasy sequence that I think is a metaphor. You know, because Norma cast them out of Eden, is how I, I read that. She cast them out of the garden, right, for sinning, in her, for, according to her rules. And that is almost like their sexual union has created a whole new garden. Is really virtually what they're driving and we're seeing foliage and flowers magically present Which themselves. I thought was beautiful, but also kind of silly because they're like... Screaming out Screaming hysterically and it just looks crazy. I'm sure that a lot of people have thoughts on how this woman reconciled. Because the problem for me is... I, we don't need to be shown and told everything. It could be understood... But the problem for me is his character demonstrated to me that he's still racist. You just called this man a beaner and threatened him. And you never said you weren't racist. You never... Also, you shot and killed a black man in front of his family. And we see him shoot someone else. We don't know who it is. And then we see that, like, his gang back in the day, like, they were in this, like, bar with swastikas. And we hear the N-word. And it's like, you were for real. Like, if you can get a check for being racist, he would have got several He men. said that he grew up... He was raised to hate people not like him. And he said he was good at it. I didn't get a sense that he was cured of that. If, no. if that's even a thing. So then the problem for me then is Maya's character seems like she is aware and upset about it. I don't know what happened between them. Not to, He says they, they didn't talk. And then all of a sudden she walks into his room and says, I want to have sex with you. That sent me. Like I almost fell off the couch. Like I just don't understand. And I think, I mean, to me, that's the most provocative part of the story and if it's about redemption, I really think we should have spent more time with these two people and him somehow making this woman comfortable enough that she could fall in love with him. I think that there's a lot going on in the background. And one is that I don't know that she's in a stable enough place to even properly contemplate it. Because um, with her own troubles with the law. And I think that she also feels like she owes him something for assisting her. It, it's complex. I think there is something titillating for people. And, you know, this man that she finds attractive that has hurt people like her is is being supplicant before her. Like, I, I think that people are sure. attracted to things that they feel like they shouldn't be. Uh, so yeah. th those are all, I think, factors wrapped up in there. And it's not... It's not He's not giving us any of the answers to properly unpack. I agree with you, and I'm going to say at the end what I think the better story would have been. But I just really didn't like 
when Joel and Maya leave, because she has a place to stay, she has an apartment, and we it's confirmed that her abusive boyfriend has been spoken to by the police. And then once we meet him, it's like, well, sounds seems like everything should be okay. Except for the drugs. Except for the drugs. But he decides to abscond with her. And then the way it plays out, I thought they had been driving, like, across country because they spend the night in hotels three times. But then on the third, or I guess on the fourth day, he gets a phone call saying that Gracewood Estates, or the, the, the garden, has been vandalized. So he goes back and he says, I'll be there in 90 minutes. But he's also met with the new handler. That's that right. So I should have put two and two together that he wasn't that far away. But it's like, where were y'all going? What was the plan? It sounds like, it seemed like they don't didn't have a plan. I don't plan, think they had one. But yeah. that was not very satisfying. Because, and that goes back to, I think, Norma, Sigourney's character, is very mercurial. Because just scenes before she cast them out, she said that she's basically, she's having some health issues. She wants to kind of retire herself. And that she's going to give... Uh, no, his name, his new name is Narvel Roth. Uh, is going that to name. Give, is going to give him a, a yearly salary, and he's it, it's going to be up to him to take care of it. And then she just wants nothing more to do with him, even though they have this. It's clear that she's sexually attracted to him. So it's, that's her way of playing games. I think he was biding his time until she was going to invite him back. She also says that when she dies, she would like the garden to be with family and that's what Maya's for. Because when Maya's there for two weeks and she doesn't won't even go say hi to her, she's playing games. Okay. They're, they're just, she's trying to say, you can't be here and sleep together and then that's supposed to be the character arc for him because when he goes back and confronts Norma, he says, we're going to live in the house as husband and wife. Which is also troubling because we haven't seen him have that conversation with Maya and while he's asserting himself away from the control of Norma, he's also placing himself in this hierarchical position of controlling this woman. Although the final shot is the two of them in like the guest house in the gardens and they're, I mean, the music, the Being lighting, they, they're, they're like sort of holding each other, doing a slow dance. So I, you, you're right. We, we don't know what she feels, but it would seem that she's okay with it. It seems like it's one of the more hopeful of Paul Schrader's endings because usually it's quite nihilistic. Uh, but then with all the, if you really are thinking of all those factors in there, it's not really hopeful. We're bumping against time. So I'm going to say what doesn't work for me is I feel like it feels out of touch, like the person who wrote it is just out of touch with these topics as they pertain to like people in 2023. But I think the better story would have been Joel Edgerton's character and Maya. Like this guy who maybe was, because we also find out that he used to be married and had kids and that part of this whole witness protection thing is that, and, and that his family also wanted to leave him. That this guy had a family and maybe his wife left him because he did something like shoot a black kid who was just like trying to sell cookies at the door. And that's when she realized he was racist and not something so like, I, I'm i racist, it's tattooed on me. Like that's what feels so like out of touch. Maybe it's like racism manifests in a lot of ways and it could just be your neighbor who all of a sudden just shot some black. Like I think that would have made more sense. And then maybe Maya's character is not fully in tune with like she grew up like biracial, has this rich family heritage, and maybe she doesn't fully recognize that that behavior isn't. So maybe both of them are learning how to be better sure. people. And then the irony of the two of them getting together. I, I didn't need all the extra meaning. Because there's a lot. Sigourney's character, there's a lot of talk about a gala, like this annual gala she throws. Mm -hmm. It felt so inconsequential. And then the vandalism to the garden and how he's appealing to her, like, which is intended to allow him to come back to the garden. But it just felt like a lot of emphasis is placed on other things when you drop this bomb of, like, this ultra-racist man loving I, a black woman. I think there could be a little more finesse with yes. the relationship between Maya and Narvel. But I think the, the Sigourney Weaver, the Norma component is... Also, going back to this, how the film opens where he says uh, gardening is a belief in the future because change will come. It's progress. Everything comes in its time. Sure. But Norma isn't really that invested in it. She is very superficially invested. She tells a story, one of my favorite scenes, when she's drunk at the dinner table at lunchtime. About her being in a Western when she was a kid. Yeah. And yeah. 
it's notable that she says that as part of the Western that her dad had her be in, uh, in this TV series, she hands the main character a flower. Uh, and just how it's all part of the metaphor, but it's the false part of the metaphor. She's all about the surface and that's it. I also love that in her sitting room, the wallpaper is jellyfish because that's to me what she is. She's, she's venomous, but only if you allow yourself to get close enough to float in and sting you. Sure. Um, and then in her final scene, and she is also a vestige of a, a time past, as in she has her, do, her dad's Luger, this World War II pistol, and that's because of the vandalism she's gotten that out, this gun that probably doesn't even work anymore. Um, she, she, she very much is like that, but I love the scene where she tries to, at, at, out of desperation, hold a gun to his head, which seems so ridiculous, but she is she's lost control and she's grasping at straws and that also is very much giving me which i love joan crawford in sudden fear with the gun we need to wrap up but um um i think the score i do like the score by dev hines who did this the score for queen and slim especially the opening credits with the unfurling orchids uh which is that specific we're told uh piece is called space and time it's very much giving me david lynch uh, Battle of Menti, Twin Peaks kind of vibes. I think Joel Edgerton is handsome. He's also starting to look like he could be Kevin Spacey's little brother. <laughs> uh, Schrader th said he wanted somebody kind of swarthy and meaty like a Robert Mitchum type for this role. And I, after reading that he said that, I thought of Mitchum quite a bit with this role. What would you give this movie? Oh, and also Victoria Hill is featured. She's the white lady as part of the gardening troupe, and she is one of my favorite parts of First Reform. She's the one singing that gospel song at the end. Okay. Oh. Uh, three and a half. I would give this film two out of five. Mm. I didn't care for it. But it's... Sigourney looks fantastic. She does. She and does. I loved every moment that I got to have with her in this. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.